Your treasure, what is it? Where do you keep it? That place where your treasure is, is the place you will most want to be and where you'll end up being. So let's stockpile treasure in heaven. It's safe there from moth and rust and burglars. It will never lose value there. Let's pursue treasure, share treasure, give treasure that lasts. Let's be generous. Well, good morning again. Welcome to North Point and a happy Father's Day again to all of our dads that are here today. We're so grateful for you. Um, we're in this short two-week series that we're calling Generous, talking about what God has to say uh, about giving and about our finances. And I told you we're going to have some stories. So that's a story from Leah there. We'll have another story from another couple uh, in just a little bit. But it is always interesting to talk about giving as a church because inevitably uh, at churches like North Point, we have guests they come every Sunday. And so I talked to somebody last week, was their first week here, and talked to them and other people that I've seen. It's the first time you've ever been here, here today. And it's like, welcome, let's talk about your money uh, today. And so I know it's a little bit odd. You so, I sort of feel like I have to say, we don't talk about this all the time, I promise. And at the same time, I don't want to apologize because we're followers of Jesus. And just like everything else in our lives, we need to see what Jesus has to say about it and then be motivated the way he wants to motivate us to be able to be faithful with what he's given us. And so here's the deal. What we wanna do is just see what Jesus has said and we want to do it. So we need to know what he has to say and then we need to do it. But you know, it doesn't always work that way. It's not always just as simple as you know what you're supposed to do and then you go ahead and do it, right? Like for instance, do your kids always do what you tell them to do the first time? Like all, you're like, all they need is the knowledge to know what to do and then every single time they do what they're supposed to do. No, of course not. You know it doesn't work that way. So sometimes this is how it works in our family that uh, myself or my wife will say something to our kids like, hey girls, it's time to get ready for bed. Absolutely no movement will take place on the first time telling the kids that it's time to get ready for bed. So my wife has come up with this ingenious thing. She says to them, who's gonna be the first to obey? And now in a household full of girls, it is a competition to see who is the best at getting ready for bed. And so all of a sudden, they are motivated to beat their sisters. It's not about obeying what their parents have said, but they just wanna be the best at getting to bed first so that they can beat their sisters. See. They needed a motivation. And the same thing is going on here that happens for you and me. It's not just enough to know what God has said, and it certainly is not enough to just do it. If we're actually gonna get from the knowing to the doing, our hearts have to be in it. We have to want to do it. We have to be motivated to be able to do it. And so that's what we're trying to do for a couple weeks in this series is to see what God has said and to get to the place where we do what he said, but if we're gonna get there, we have to want to do it. Here's the good news. God is in the heart changing business. He's in the heart motivating business. And what we saw even last week from 2 Corinthians chapter eight and verse nine, the most significant text I think for all of us when it comes to finances is this scripture that says this, for you know the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ, that though he was rich, yet for your sake he became poor so that you through his poverty might become rich. There it is. That's our motivation right there, right? The grace of Jesus to us, modeled to us, the example to us, but also doing it for us first. Jesus being generous to us, he becomes poor so that we might become rich. Now, maybe this, you might become rich, that might mean that you become financially rich. Maybe it might mean that. Um, that certainly hasn't been true for much of church history for many followers of Jesus. And, and it's not true for many followers of Jesus to this day. Uh, and so this verse is not a promise to you that you're gonna be financially rich. Like believe in Jesus, become a follower and you're gonna be a millionaire. Like you're gonna be loaded if you just believe in Jesus. It doesn't work like that. That's not what this is saying. And yet at the same time, many of us, um, we are prosperous. We are wealthy, right? Like, have you ever thought about how today that you and I live better than kings used to live. Have you ever had this thought? We live better than the most wealthiest, greatest people of the past, like kings. We live better than kings used to live. So think about it. Uh, back in the day when we had kings, what would the benefits be of being a king? Well, it, it would be things like running water and hot running water, being able to take hot baths and showers, um, having feasts, 
all sorts of wonderful cuisines, having big parties where you have people come in. Um, it would mean that you drive around in chariots. You have an entourage with you. You have counselors that are available to you at any time to give you wisdom and direction for what you should do. You live in a palace, right? You live in a place that's very luxurious and spacious. And now just think about your life. Here's my life. Um, I have a tankless hot water heater, which gives me endless hot water, right? And with um, seven of us that are in our house, we could take showers for three hours and never run out of hot water. It just continually runs. I could run it for days and it continues to come. Um, I can eat any cuisine that I want at any time during the day. Asian, Mexican, American, Italian food delivered straight to my door from Grubhub, right? At any time I wanna have it. Feast, whenever I wanna have it. I drive three chariots. They happen to be Hondas for our, our family, but we, we have those as well. I have a five bedroom house. I have Google. I have a library that is full of books. I have a dishwasher, a washing machine, TV, Spotify, and they just put a Starbucks up that is in like eye shot distance from my house, coffee whenever I want it. We live better than kings used to live. And also nobody's trying to assassinate me and take my throne, right? At least I don't think so. We'll see what's happening in the house, right? Um, we have amenities that kings used to only dream about having. And so that probably means something for how we use the resources that God has given to us. And even just a little bit of perspective on that, on how wealthy we are can help. But that's not what this verse is actually talking about. It's not talking about us being financially prosperous. What it actually means is that Jesus became physically socially and economically and spiritually impoverished so that we might be called children of God. So that you and I can have a relationship with the God who created us by becoming nothing, by becoming human, by giving up his life for us on the cross, stripped naked and bare with no earthly possessions left when he gave up his life so that we might know the God who created us, so that he might live in us today, so that we have his presence in our lives and this promise of an eternal inheritance that will be better than anything we have ever seen here. Jesus became poor so that we might become rich in relationship with God and experience all of those blessings. Look, he's given us everything that we have, spiritual and financial blessings. So what we're doing is we're trying to say, thank you, Jesus, for everything you've given me. Help me to know what you want me to do with what you've given me. We just open our hands to him and we open our hearts to say, all right, Jesus, show me what to do with this. And what he does is he shows us what to do, always motivating us from the heart with grace, but then also with clarity about how to give and how much to give and what we should do. And so today I wanna, I wanna push into this practically speaking just a little bit more about how, how should we give and how much should we give? Like, what does Jesus want from us? Uh, but to make sure that we're motivated the right way and um, we're thinking the right way, I wanna remind us of the three truths that we saw last week about giving from 2 Corinthians chapter nine. So if you have a Bible, go ahead and turn to 2 Corinthians chapter nine. I'll make reference to a couple things we saw there last week. And let's just go over these three, three truths from last week about giving. The first thing that we saw is this, is that giving is all about investing in what really matters. That's what's going on here. We're seeking to invest in things that really matter. This comes off of Jesus's words, right? Store up treasures in heaven. I mean, take care of yourselves here. Like work hard, work a job, be diligent, enjoy what God has given to you, but don't get distracted by life here. Uh, don't get distracted by always upping the lifestyle. Um, don't obligate your, yourself to so many things financially here that you can't be generous and have open hands with what God has given to you. You can't take it with you. Right? You're not gonna take it with you when you die. And so use things here and love people and give to them and care for their needs. Right? Live, live, live a reasonable life here, but be generous with what God has given you. And don't give God leftovers. Right? Don't give God leftovers because look at chapter nine and verse six. Whoever sows sparingly, that is whoever gives sparingly, will reap sparingly. And whoever gives generously will also reap generously. And then verse 11 you have been enriched in every way by God so that you can be generous on every occasion. This means that we are partnering with God. We're investing in what really matters. We're thinking about his work and his kingdom, so thankful for everything that he has blessed us with. 
The second truth that we saw is that our giving should be planned. So not only are we trying to partner with God and invest in what really matters, but our giving should be thought about. Like we should pray about it. We should think about it. We should consider it. Verse seven goes on to say, each one should give as you've decided in your heart to give. So there's our motivation to give. It's a heart motivation. Like we're giving out of grace, the grace God's given to us. That's what God always wants. But we're also planning and thinking about it. Now, here's the deal. I know that um, many of you, you spend a lot of time on finances. Uh, Some of you, you spend a lot more time than you actually want to spend. And you know that you shouldn't spend as much time as you do spend. But we just are a culture. We really value our money. And we spend a lot of time thinking about retirement and investments and the stock market, I've talked to some of you, you're like, I'm on my computer all the time, constantly looking at the market. Is it going up? Is it going down? How much do I have in retirement? Do I shift this over here? Do I, do I invest in this? Do I pull money out of this? Do I need to call my financial planner? I, am I make sure that we're, do we have enough? Are we going to be okay? Do we got the insurance that we need? All, in some degree, some of that is fine. But what I'm going to ask you to do is this, to take all of that effort and energy that you put into your finances and put that into your giving as a first priority. Come before God with all that effort and energy and say, all right, God, this is actually all yours. So what do you want me to give? And how do you want me to give? And how can I get my heart aligned with yours to invest in those things that really matter? You want me to be taken care of. That's all good. But I also want to invest with you, not as an afterthought, but as a first priority. And we'll talk about how we can do that a little bit more in just a minute, but let's keep the right motivation in front of us. That's our third principle, which is this, that giving should be motivated by joy. This is what God always wants for us. And so verse seven of 2 Corinthians 9 goes on to say, I don't want you to give reluctantly, like, and we have to give, or under compulsion, somebody's twisting my arm and making me do it and I feel guilt, so fine, I'll just give. Because God loves a, what kind of giver? Cheerful giver, a cheerful giver. He wants you to actually be happy about it. He wants you to enjoy it and he wants to bless you in your giving. That's what he always wants. And so this is why we don't have dollar amounts in this great text on giving. There's no dollar amounts that are here because it's not as much about the amount or hard and fast rules. It's about the heart. It's about having joy in our generosity, just like Jesus is generous, just like Jesus has been generous to you. And so Jesus wants to partner with you in meeting other people's needs and advancing his kingdom and his work on this earth and accomplishing what he wants to do. And he wants this to bring you joy and he blesses you in this. Like for instance, um, we had a VBS this last week here at North Point and we haven't done VBS for a number of years, but coming out of the pandemic, we were like, I think we should do VBS. Like our kids haven't had a lot. We've got an opportunity to do it. Let's do it. And so this last week we had over um, 150 preschoolers through third graders that were in this space right here, dancing, jumping up and down to songs, making crafts, playing games and hearing truths about Jesus to grow in their relationship with him and come to see who he is. Now, here's the thing that many of you that are in here, you did volunteer and you served and we thank you for that. You were engaged with these kids by your physical presence and being here with them and making it possible. But even if you weren't here, but you have contributed financially to North Point Church, do you realize that when you watch that recap video of VBS like we had at the beginning of the service, you share the blessings of that. And when you see it, you should say in your heart, I was a part of that. God used me to help buy snacks, to buy the music, to buy the crafts, uh, to be able to pay the, the salaries of staff members who have organized and put these things together and lead these things. You share in the blessings of that as a financial contributor to God's work. And you should feel that because giving is all about investing in what really matters. Your giving should be thought out and it should be motivated by joy. And then you share in the blessings of what God does through what you give. So if these truths are guiding our giving, then how much should we be giving? Like, what does that look like? Like, um, we know there aren't hard rules, Uh, God wants this to be from the heart, but is there some help on like how much we should give? What would a generous heart look like, practically speaking? So let's probe that a little bit more. And I I wanna hit this from a few uh, different angles this morning. And the one we're gonna start with is this. If you were to, uh, to study all of the New Testament scriptures, which would be the time from when Jesus comes onward, okay? Um, You would never find a percentage or a dollar amount that is given to us. 
because there's no hard and fast rules that we have. There would be no number. Now, in the Old Testament scripture, the first half of our Bible before Jesus comes, we're operating as the people of God under what's called the law, and you do have a percentage. You do have a harder and a faster rule. And in the Old Testament, the people of God were required to give a tithe, and a tithe equaled 10%, 10% of their income. Now, some Bible scholars would tell us that actually the people of God were supposed to give a whole lot more than this. If you look at all the different rules and laws and you are a really good Israelite, you would be giving over 30% of your income if you followed all the things God was asking you to do. But the baseline for the people of God in the Old Testament was a tithe. It was 10% of their income. And so that's a, a decent place to start to say, hey, I either, wanna, I either wanna get up to that or I wanna try to push towards that or I wanna be at 10% of my giving. That would probably be a pretty good baseline. But under Jesus, as we've seen, he brings in a principle that we might call grace giving or grace motivated giving so that it's less about dollar amounts and percentages and it's more about the heart. It's more about being a generous person from the inside out that partners with God rather than just checking a box and saying, well, I did it. I did the 10%, it's my religious duty, and I'm probably going to heaven because I gave God 10% and I'm following his rules, right? It, it's, Jesus is shifting things. For instance, when Jesus comes in that, in that big sermon that he did called the Sermon on the Mount, he begins to say things to people that were operating under the law. He begins to say things like this. You've heard that it was said in the law, you should not commit adultery. Jesus doesn't say, I'm bringing grace in and actually now you can do whatever you wanna do or you shouldn't really commit adultery, but if you do, it's okay because I want your heart to be motivated. And if your heart doesn't feel like that, then you just do what you wanna do. Now, what does he say? He ups the ante, doesn't he? He says, you've heard that it said, uh, you should not commit adultery in the law, but I tell you that if you look on somebody and you lust after them, you've already committed adultery in your heart. Oh, that's bigger. He's pushing us to more, right? Is what he is doing here. And so, so this, this thing of, of tithing and grace-motivated giving, it kind of begs a question to us. If tithing 10% is not, it's not emphasized in the New Testament and it's no longer required, but now we're operating on grace-motivated giving, does that likely mean that we will give less than 10% or more than 10%? What we come to see is this, is that grace never motivates us to do less. It always empowers us to do more than that, right? If we think, oh, um, Grace means I can do whatever I want and God loves a cheerful giver, right? So if I'm not, I'm a cheerful 1% giver. So like, that's what I'm gonna give, right? I'm not gonna do more than that. So I don't have to do more than that. No, I, I don't think it works that way because grace doesn't motivate us to do less. It always empowers us to do more and not out of duty and not out of obligation, not because we have to, but because grace changes our hearts. It changes who we are from the inside out and it produces generosity from within us. I got another uh, text in the New Testament where um, Paul is writing to a young pastor named Timothy who's over a church at Ephesus. And in 1 Timothy chapter six, Paul gives us some more direction on this. And he says this, he says, Timothy, um, command those in your church who are, are rich in this present world not to be arrogant or to put their hope in wealth because it's so uncertain. Now, this is a good challenge for us, right? If God has blessed us, to, to, he says, don't, don't put your hope, uh, don't make your security be in your bank account and what you have in the bank or, or in your portfolio because you have to know that is so uncertain. If you have lived in this world in the last year and a half, you know that financial markets, that money is so uncertain. Bitcoin, anyone? GameStop, uh, gas prices, inflation. I remember a Six months ago, some of the economists were saying, oh, we're not too worried about inflation. It's probably gonna be okay. You know, the Fed's like not too worried about inflation. I'm like, I'm worried about inflation. Six months ago, and I'm not even an economist. Like, if you tried to buy a car lately or even a used vehicle, look at gas prices, grocery prices, the cost of goods, all these other things, of course it's a problem because it fluctuates. Things go up and down. Money is very, very uncertain. So don't find your security in there. Don't hope in it, but put your hope in God. God who richly provides us with everything that we have and get this, for our enjoyment. Now that's, that's interesting. This is an important part of our theology and our thinking about finances. God is the one who provides everything that we need. He cares for you. So everything you have comes from God and he wants you to, what is this word? He wants you to enjoy it. God is not a killjoy. God never condemns money out of hand. 
He never says that money itself is evil. He never condemns rich people just simply for being rich or being wealthy. What the Bible condemns is the love of money. It says the love of money. Finding your security in money is the root of all kinds of evil. But as God blesses you and richly provides you with what you have, he wants you to enjoy the life that he has given you. He does want you to enjoy that, but he also wants something else from you. Verse 18 goes on to say this, command them also to do good with what I've given them. Command them to be rich in good deeds and to be generous from their hearts and willing to share. So God wants you to enjoy what he's blessed you with, but he also wants to produce inside of your heart a generous spirit that gives generously and cares for others' needs. Why? Verse 19, in this way, they will lay up treasure for themselves as a firm foundation for the coming age so that they may take hold of the life that is truly life. So God has richly blessed you with everything that he's given you in life so that you can be generous and in that way store up treasures in heaven. This sounds like Jesus, right? So that you might take hold of true life, that you might not be controlled by money, that you might not be misdirected and misfocused when it comes to finances, that you might not be distracted, uh, hoarding money or um, being stingy with money, but storing up treasures in heaven so that you can take hold of what is truly life. Now, you notice something when we go through 1 Timothy 6, once again, there's no dollar amount that is listed there, but a principle. And the principle is grace-motivated generosity. God has richly provided what we need so that we can be rich in good deeds and generous to others. So do you think generosity typically means less giving or more? On the issue of how much to give, C.S. Lewis helps us with this. Um, And whenever you wanna make a strong point, you quote C.S. Lewis. So here's your C.S. Lewis quote for the day. He says this, I don't believe one can settle how much we ought to give. Good, right? This is gonna be an appeal, not a command. I'm afraid the only safe rule is to give more than we can spare. In other words, if our expenditures on comforts and luxuries and amusements is up to the standard common among those with the same income as our own, we're probably giving away too little. If our charities do not at all pinch or hamper us, I should say they are too small. There ought to be things we should like to do and we cannot do because our charitable expenditure excludes them. How do you... How do you make sure that money is not an idol to you, that it's not a God, that you're not consumed and controlled by it? Like, how do you make sure that your security is not ultimately in your bank account? Perhaps this is the answer. You give more than you can spare. You, You loosen your grip on that. And you ask God what he wants you to do. And you seek to see his generosity to you to propel you into a place of generosity with all that you have. Lewis pushes us very practically here, again, with an appeal, not a command, but an appeal to be pinched a bit, to give up some things for the sake of giving generously. Now, hear me very carefully on this. I don't think that God wants you to give up eating. Maybe if you're going to fast for a day or two, but he doesn't want you to starve to death. And he doesn't want you to um, give up paying your electric bill and caring for your basic needs. We saw from 1 Timothy 6, he wants you to enjoy what he has given to you. As some of you as well, you need to hear me carefully. You're in a tough financial situation. You've lost your job or you're looking for a job. I think a single parents as well, who it's just hard sometimes to just get through and make it. There is grace for you on this. God is not trying to make you feel bad, make you feel guilty. He wants your heart to be engaged with this. So don't see God trying to twist your arm. But for many of us, God has blessed us very generously financially. And so for us, it it might mean this. It might mean not obligating yourself to so much debt. I've had people (laughs) say to me things before, like, we just can't give. I just don't know where we can give. But part of that is that they've obligated themselves to so many things financially in choices that they have planned and made that, yeah, at the end of the day where the dollars come out, they can't give, but it's because of choices that you've made to obligate yourself to so many things financially. It might mean for us holding back on some wants that we have. It might mean going more simple with lifestyle choices or avoiding the Amazon for a while. I shouldn't even tell you this, but Amazon Prime Day is happening this week. 
And it might mean for you, like, I'm just not gonna go. I'm just not gonna do it. I'm not gonna search the daily deals, the hot buy. I'm not gonna do it, shut off the emails, unsubscribe. I just don't even wanna see. I don't need another Alexa. I want another Alexa, but I don't need another. No, no, I don't need the latest one. It might mean getting rid of a streaming service or two. I can't tell you what it's supposed to be for you, and I wouldn't do that. That's between you and God. But you need to ask the question. You need to ask him what he wants and to be open to him, knowing that grace Motivated giving, a generous life, it means more giving, pushing to more, not less. So um, to make this even more concrete and practical, I wanna introduce to you a tool that we are beginning to use here at North Point to teach about giving. And this is an effort for those of you that are followers of Jesus and you are a part of North Point particularly to plan your giving and to grow in your giving. And it begins to answer the question like, what is expected? Like, what should I be giving? Because I, I told you last week, I've had some people say like, what should we be giving? What, what is that supposed to look like? And this is the first time we've ever sort of put that down on paper and said, hey, this is out of, out of grace, motivation always, but this is a plan that we think our people here at North Point should be a part of and can get on board with. So um, you have around your seats, these generous booklets. Would you grab one of those and open that up uh, with me? So see if you could find one on the seats around your maybe seat in front of you. And if you open that up, uh, you'll notice that on the first page, it talks about grace, generosity, and giving because we always want you to be motivated that way and keep that in front of you. But on the next page is what we're calling um, the giving ladder. And the giving ladder is just this practical tool for thinking about where you are at and to help you to grow in giving. And the idea with this is gonna be that you first would step onto the ladder. You might not be on the ladder, but that you would step onto the ladder and then over time, you would prayerfully think about taking a step up the ladder. So let me describe the rungs of this ladder to you. We'll start off on the very bottom rung to get on the ladder would be that you would become an initial giver. That you're like, hey, I'll, I'll, I haven't really given before. I haven't even thought much about it, but like, I think I should do this, so I'll try it out. I will give something uh, to God and I'll just, I'll just see what God does. I wanna try this out. I wanna try to be obedient to what God says, so I will give something. The next rung up would be that you become a consistent giver where you begin to give regularly, just in a consistent way. And it might not even be a lot, it might be a little bit, but you're like, I'm just gonna make a pattern of planning, thinking, praying, and then giving in a consistent way. You might use um, automatic withdrawals. You might lose, use our online system. You might, write, you might, some of you are still check writers. You might write a check and you might do it every month or twice a month, or you might do it every other month, or, but it's just a consistent decision that you're making to make sure that you give in a regular, consistent way. The next step up the rung would be what we're calling an intentional giver, where you say, okay, now I'm gonna increase my giving. And maybe you begin pulling back on some of the wants that you have to be able to give more. You maybe begin asking yourself this question, why do I spend more on Starbucks every month than I give to God? Why is my cell phone bill more than what I'm giving to my church? Why is my car payment more than what I give to God? Something that just begins to be like, that's just, I don't know if that's quite right. And so you begin to move towards this 10% of giving. You're getting close to giving 10% of your income in this to God as you become an intentional, consistent giver. The next rung up on the ladder would be what we're calling a generous giver. Where you say, I'm gonna sacrifice to give even more. I'm gonna keep pushing on this. And you intentionally give up some things. You let some things, as Lewis says, pinch and hamper you to be able to give in a more generous way. And so this is someone who's opened their heart and their hands to God and said, God, I wanna be sacrificial. I wanna really partner with you. I wanna see what you might do as I give faithfully and diligently to you. And then the final rung that we have up on the ladder is what we'll call a legacy giver, is where you move to, I'll only keep what I need. This is the person that begins to move from, God, what do you want me to give to, God, what do I need to keep to just to survive, to make it in life? You're propelled by generosity and sacrifice and you see the opportunity God has given you to significantly partner with his work and make a substantial impact in his kingdom. You've pushed well beyond 10% of your giving and you seek to do as much as you can. Now, a number of years ago, I was uh, very much influenced as I think about this, particularly this legacy giver part uh, by a pastor that you would know who he is, but... Um, he shared with another group of pastors in a, in a conference setting about how God has moved in his heart with giving. And he, he, he really opened himself up. And I felt like he did in a way that wasn't arrogant, but he was just trying to be helpful with us. But he, he sort of shared about his own journey with giving. 
And he talked about that when he was very young, he and his wife decided that every single year, if God would bless them, they were going to give more than they gave the previous year as a percentage. Now he said, now sometimes we had very slim years and we didn't make much. So that percentage was like a quarter of a percent that we gave the next year, but he made a decision, this is what we were going to do. And as he was faithful with that when he was young and didn't have much, God eventually allowed him to write the second best selling book of all time, The Purpose Driven Life. And he became a millionaire from those book sales, selling all of those books. And he said, you know, the reason I think God allowed me to do that is because he knew what I would do with the money because I had been faithful to him from the very beginning. And so when that happened and we got all this money, we're like, what are we gonna do? He's like, we're gonna do what we've always done. We're gonna give it away. And so he's at the place in his life now where he gives away over 90% of his income. He started charities and foundations. He paid his church back for all the salary they have ever paid him. He doesn't take a salary from his church. And you may think, well, if you're a millionaire, multimillionaire and you lived off 10% of your income, I mean, that's still pretty good, right? And so he shared with us, he goes, you know what? I buy my jeans at Walmart. I drive the same car I've driven for the last 10 to 15 years. I've never moved to different homes and I wear this Casio watch. It works just as good as your Rolex, you know? And so he should, like, I didn't up my lifestyle. He said, I just decided this is what I was gonna do. We made a decision when I was young and this is what God has called me to do. And he wasn't saying you have to do exactly what I did, but trying to model to us that you can, you can get here, but you've got to step on the ladder first, open your hands to God and then just take some steps in prayer with him about that. Now notice that on this ladder, um, there's no dollar amounts that are assigned here because what it might look like for a generous giver that makes $50,000 a year is different than a generous giver that makes $250,000 a year. It's about your heart and opening your hands to God. And that's gonna look a little bit different for everyone. Now, I know that a couple of other things might be happening in your hearts right now. Um, Some of you are very competitive people. So you look at this and you might be like, I ain't even on the ladder, but I'm about to be a legacy giver tomorrow. Like I'm gonna run up the rungs of the ladder because I am gonna nail this thing. And if God's gonna bless my life and I'm gonna be happy, then I'm just gonna do it. And listen to me carefully. As your pastor, I'm telling you, don't do it. Simmer down. This is not a competition. That is not a spiritual duty. This is not something that you're trying to accomplish and beat other people at, okay? I want you to be on there. I want you to move up to a legacy giver, but you've got to start somewhere with a heart that sees the generosity of Jesus and you make a cognitive, prayerful, heartfelt decision to step on and then to step up. And just remember that your pastor told you, don't be a legacy giver right away, okay? So, all right. Second thing is that some of you might be looking at this and you're just, you're sinking a little bit lower into your seat and you're mad at me right now. Cause you're like, you just recoil a little bit because you're like, he's talking about my money. What it was nerve of this guy to talk about my money like this and suggest things. Um, But I just wanna, I just wanna challenge you. Look, I love you. I really do love you. And I wanna say this in my most loving pastor voice that I can. It's not your money. It's not my money and it's not your money. And I want God's best for you. And I want his joy to be in your life. And I want you to be free from the love of money. I want you to trust him with your life and open your hands to him. You may hate this ladder. You may despise it. You might have a nightmare about it because you just hate we're talking about this right now. And I don't care if you never think about this ladder again. I just want the generosity of Jesus to be in your heart and you to be free in this. Jesus is the one that said, it's more blessed to give than to receive. And I want that for you. I want that for us as a church. And so together, here's just a practical tool that you can use to just say, hey, where am I at? And God, would you help me to take a step up this ladder? There's a couple of other things in this book I just wanna draw your attention to. Uh, On the next page, if you would flip over, there are different ways that you can give to help your giving be regular. And then types of giving. There's ways to give, uh, types of giving that maybe you've never even thought about before. I mean, we, we have people contribute by giving property. We have people that give year-end gifts. We have people that give stocks and things like that to contribute to the church in, in ways maybe you've not thought about before. And then on the final page is one of the, one of the most important pieces of this is just the impact of your generosity. And I'll just remind you again to read through that and just to think about like, as I partner with God's church, and if you might be a guest and you might be part of another local church. So you could just take this and apply it to where, whatever church that you're a part of. If you're here at North Point, this is for you. When you contribute to God's work here, there are so many things that he does. We have about 14 to 1500 people that would say that they're part of North Point Church, right? And so you're contributing to those individuals hearing the gospel every week and people now actually around the United States and around the world through the online services that we have. 
You contribute to foster care and adoption, to overtime, to the study table, to refugee ministry, to Agape Pregnancy Center, to 22 missionaries in 10 countries around the world, to uh, enabling North Point to hire staff who counsel and care for and shepherd and do weddings and funerals and, and help marriages be restored. You're, you're helping to provide the context for people to develop friendships and people to do life with here in our community. And you're helping to raise children from poverty through Compassion International. We support, as a church, over 170 uh, individuals, kids, through Compassion International. Many of you are a part of that. Look, that's an investment. And I know giving financially is an investment from you, but you share in all of these blessings and many, many more. Let me just share to finish this up a few other things just uh, with you from my heart. Um, I got to tell you that personally, um, my wiring as a person is not to worry that much uh, about money. And everybody's wired a little bit differently. For me, it's just never been like a big thing that, that I've really worried about. And you might say, well, maybe Jeremy, you've never had a reason to worry about it. Maybe, but when Michelle and I first got married, we did live below the poverty level and we ate SpaghettiOs and ramen noodles. One time, I'm not gonna tell you which one of us, but one time, one of us went to Burger King and got a dollar double cheeseburger and the other spouse got really ticked off and we had a major fight in our first like three months of marriage because somebody was splurging and the other one did not get to enjoy that thing. So I've, I've felt that about like, are we gonna be able to, I don't even know how we're gonna survive on, on less than minimum wage. Um, and yet God took care of us um, and at that time, for sure, money was a little bit more of a worry and a concern for me. But I'm not, I just don't really get worked up about this kind of thing. There's other things I do, but not this. And the reason I just tell you that is because that means I don't feel like I have to try to coerce you, even as your pastor, to support this church. I don't feel like I have to twist your arm because I know that's not what Jesus wants. I know that he's gonna take care of our needs, that he's gonna be good to us that he's gonna be gracious to us, but I also know that he does that through you, through the generous giving of his people. And I really want you to partner with him. I want you to open your hands to him. And as a church, I want us to make a significant impact for his kingdom. You may not know this, but a couple of things I need to tell you. You may not know that most of the year, North Point runs in the red. Most years, almost through the entire year, we wait till December to see if we're gonna have enough income to really cover the things that we've done throughout the year, which means that we always live in this position, our staff does throughout the entire year of, I think we can do this, I hope we can do this, I don't know, it typically has come in, maybe it'll come in, we'll see, but it does hamper us from dreaming a little bit more and investing a little bit more significantly in the work of God when we always have to be cautious throughout the year. And God's always taking care of our needs, but it'd be really great through regular consistent giving of our people to be able to uh, just be a little bit more intentional with that and with our giving and in a little better place. You know, um, the church has no other means of funding. I think you know this, but sometimes people don't realize this. It comes from the people that make up the church. Um, I've tried to get the elders to let me do the Bitcoin thing and to buy lottery tickets, scratchers, but they're like, no scratchers, Jeremy, you gotta stop that. No, I'm just kidding. I'm kidding, just make sure that's on the video. Um, so, if you, if you just think about it logically, if you, if you say to yourself, hey, I receive spiritual care from this place, I get to hear God's word, I get to worship God, I develop friendships here, I'm in a group, whatever, um, I should contribute to that spiritual care. It's just logical, right? That the place that you're a part of, that feeds you, that cares for you, that you would contribute to that place. So let's do this, church. Let's be in this together. Let's get on the ladder. Let's take a step up the ladder, knowing that Jesus has enriched us in every way so that we can be generous on every occasion, knowing that we get to partner with him. And as we do, we take hold of the life that is truly life.